I thought, I really wish I could be just like that person. I really wish I could trade places with that person. And I used to, I used to wonder uh, what it would be like to be a pastor of a church of thousands of people. Uh, I used to think about it, and, and I used to think, it must be so amazing, it must be so impressive and amazing to look out and see thousands of people listening to the sermon, thousands of people coming to worship God. Uh, I, I, you know, I would be so impressed by big church buildings and uh, big church events, and it was just something about it, it was just so impressive, so, uh, so amazing about gathering thousands of people to, to worship God. And, you know, as a pastor, when I looked at that, it looked like success. Uh, I would see pictures of big churches, or I would, I would see these churches, and I felt like that is what, that is what it means to get to the top. That is what it means to succeed. And I used to, part of me, I used to think, I wish I could be in their shoes. I think it'd be great to, to be at a mega church and to be a pastor of all these people. And then I came to Mana Church, which is a mega church. Uh, there are thousands of people worshiping here every week. And I saw how heavy the burden was on the senior pastor. I saw how, how much he struggled under that incredible burden of leadership. You know, for sure there are a lot of positives. There are many things that are positive about you know, being the senior pastor of such a big church. Uh, it comes with incredible blessings, incredible good things. But I also realized that when God gives you those incredible blessings, there's also a very big calling that he has on your life. There's also a very big responsibility that he has for you. And I realized that if I did get those crowds, if I did have thousands of people to, to minister to, I realized as I thought about it, I don't think I have the character to handle that kind of ministry. I don't think I have the integrity to be able to handle all of that fame, all of that success, all of the things that people would say about me. I realized that I would use that blessing to fill an emptiness in me. That there was still something that I need to work on. That I would not use that blessing to bless others, but I would use that blessing to increase myself, to strengthen myself. I don't know what it is that you are jealous of. I don't know what it is that makes you very envious. I don't know who are the people that you look at and you wish I could be, I wish I could be in their shoes. I wish I could live their lives. Uh, we, all, we all have people like that, right? We've all been jealous. We've all been envious at some point. Uh, we've all wished at some point that our lives were more like their lives. Now, there are two parts to jealousy. There is desire and there is anger. We want something they have. That's desire. And we're angry that we don't have what they have. Right? Desire and anger. Uh, so envy is not just I want what they have, but there's an there's a anger, there's a sense where you're upset. Right? And the anger, the resentment side of it, what it does is that actually hurts our relationship with people, right? Uh, when you're envious of someone, when you're jealous of someone, you don't just want what they have, but you don't like that person. Isn't that true? Uh, you, you actually, part of you wants that person to fail. You don't, you don't enjoy when they do better. You don't enjoy when they experience success. Part of you wishes that they would fail, that they would stumble. So you want to switch places. You want to switch places with them, but there's also a part of you that wants to harm them. 
There's also part of you that is upset with what they have. Now, in our reading today, where we look at the, the reading, the, the writings of a man named Asaph. And Asaph, he was a worship leader. And he was a worship leader who was jealous. But it's really surprising who he was jealous of. Verse 3, verse 3 says, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I just realized I never read the passage for you all. <laughs> Let me pause here for a moment. I'm going to read the song for you. I'm sorry, I, I just totally skipped that. I'm going to read the passage. Psalm chapter 73, verses 1 to 17. This is a song again by Asaph, a uh, worship leader. He said, Truly, God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are, they are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I would speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. <coughs> now, if you look at what he's jealous of here, he says he's envious of arrogant, rich people who are openly sinning. Isn't that surprising? Here is this worship leader, someone who's supposed to be a leader of God, and he's saying, I'm jealous of these people who are proud and arrogant uh, and cocky, and they're rich and wealthy, and they're openly singing. I wish I could be in their shoes. But their arrogance is very specific. He, he points to a very specific kind of arrogance. He says, these people ask, in verse 11, how can God know? Is there any knowledge in the Most High? So what is he saying? He's saying, these people, they're openly mocking God. They're, they're openly denying Him. They're, they're saying God is powerless. God doesn't know anything. He, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have any control. And God, He is meaningless. He's insignificant. This is really shocking. And so, He is not just envious of arrogant people. But he's envious of these people who are so arrogant that they openly mock God and ridicule God and say, God has no power. God has no control. But when we look at this a little, a little more closely, if we examine what's going on here, I think we may find that we can relate. I think all of us here well, we're going to find that this is closer to our hearts uh, than we may think. Now in verses 12 and 13, he says, Behold, these are the wicked. Right? Always at ease and so comfortable. 
they increase in riches. They're, the rich are just getting richer, right? They're, they're comfortable, they're getting richer. And then he said in verse 13, all in vain have I kept my heart clean. It was all for nothing. And washed my hands in innocence. I was pure and holy for nothing. I was obedient for nothing. Now, have you ever thought this? Why do I have to sacrifice so much for God? When I see people who don't care about God, they, they live their lives however they want, and they're living so well, right? They're rich, they're comfortable, they're successful, they have everything that I want, their lives are perfect, they're wealthy, they're successful. Why do I have to sacrifice so much for God and not reap the benefits? Why do I see them so much more successful, so much happier than I am? Have you ever thought that? I'm pretty sure if we're all honest with ourselves, and you, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you have thought that. You have thought that at some point. Maybe this is what you're struggling with right now. I don't know. But we have all thought this at some point. What this psalmist is saying, sometimes it feels like serving God and living for God and loving God are just a waste of time. In fact, he goes beyond just sometimes. He says, it was all for nothing. There was no benefit. Right? He doesn't say it was somewhat beneficial. He says it was all vanity. It was worthless. And he says, it's because it's totally unfair. I suffer, and they're blessed. I sacrifice, and they just get richer. They do whatever they want. I can't do whatever I want. Why can't I do whatever I want? So the question he's asking is really a very devastating one, actually. And it's this. He's saying, why should I follow God? Why should I follow him? If there's no benefit, if there's no apparent blessing, why follow him? Why, why suffer like this? Why sacrifice like this when there doesn't seem to be any concrete benefit? I'm sure we've all asked this at some point. Why should I follow God? Why am I following him? I'm not, I mean, my friend who's not Christian, he seems, seems to be so much better off than me. Why, why should I follow him? My family members, they, they tell me that I'm foolish for going to church and for sacrificing so much. Why should I follow him? Sometimes we look at the world and the world seems totally okay without God. And it, it almost seems like we're foolish for investing so much into this thing that doesn't give back what we want it to. Now remember that I said the Psalms should be shaping and forming both how we think and how we feel, right? It's, it's, it should, it, it should uh, influence our, our mindset and it should influence our emotions. Now, what does it mean that God would ask us to feel what this person is feeling? to enter into his doubts, to enter into his fears, to enter into his struggle, his anger, his jealousy. What does it mean that God is saying, I want everyone to sing this song as worship. Remember, this is corporate worship song. So this is not just one person reading this or singing this. This was a whole congregation of people all singing this song together as worship. What does that mean? I think, first of all, God is telling us that worshiping Him also involves understanding each other and bearing each other's burdens and going into each other's stories. This means that we can't say, well, you know, that's not my problem. I'm not struggling like that, right? Maybe we hear about someone who has these kind of struggles or maybe you know, we hear about some other kind of struggle and we may think, well, you know, that's not, that's not how I'm struggling. That's not my problem. That's not my experience. 
you know, or maybe we don't even respect that person's struggle. We say, how could that person ask God that question? How could they say, why follow God? I don't respect that person's position, so I'm not even going to try to understand that person. I think they're just, they shouldn't even say anything. I don't know if that's ever how you felt. I felt that sometimes. Sometimes I'll hear about someone's struggle, and I won't understand why they struggle that way. And there's a part of me that says, I don't respect your struggle, because it's not theologically correct. It's not the right way to approach God. So I don't even want to understand why you might be feeling that way. But God here is saying, you cannot do that. You cannot tell someone that I don't want to be a part of your story. You have to all sing this story. You have to all feel the feelings in this song and experience what this feels like. Secondly, what I think this is saying is, if I'm making this spiritual struggle my worship, even though it's not my struggle, if I'm singing this song along with everyone else and I'm making it my story, right? not just someone else's story, but making it my song and my story, and everyone is doing that. Every single person in the congregation is singing this song at the same time. What do you think that would feel like for that one person maybe who does feel that way? For that one person who is really struggling and is feeling like, God, you know, I don't understand why these people who do evil are so rich. And that person feels like, I'm such a terrible person for feeling this way. And think about it, and then everyone sings this song about that person's struggle. How do you think that person feels? That person feels understood. Wow. Everyone is joining my story. All of these people, the church is coming together around me and saying, we will experience your doubts, we will experience your jealousy, we will experience your struggle and your, your doubts and your fears, all of those things, we will be a part of that. Even though it's not our story, we will make it our story, because that is worship. It's not just I'm an island, and you're an island, and your business is not my business. It's, we're all in this together. Your story is my story. I want to be involved. The Psalms are, are really incredible. The more, you know, some of you here know we've been doing this series for a while now. We've been going through different Psalms, and I'm just being blown away by the Psalms because the more I read the Psalms and I study it, I've never studied the Psalms this intensely. I've studied other books very intensely. I've studied Romans very intensely. Uh, the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I've studied them very intensely. But the Psalms, never. Not like this. But they're incredible the more I look at them. Because we see God commanding us telling us that worship has to include the stories of other people. Right? Sometimes we make worship just about, it's between me and God, right? If only this is okay, then that's it. But God is saying, no, worship cannot be just between you and me. You have to be involved in all of these stories. You have to be willing to be experiencing all of this, bearing their burdens. And in this case, I just want to really impress on you, in this case, this is a really amazing thing that God is telling us to join in. Because it is almost complete denial of who God is. Right? God has done nothing. Right? He's saying, it was all for nothing. All of my worship, all of my service, it was for nothing. And God is saying, make this your worship. Join this person. Join him. But as we see in this song, uh, understanding this person is not the end. Right? Just joining them is not where God wants us to stop. Uh, he wants us to, to move into a different place. So we're going to see where God wants to take us with this. Verses 16 to 17 say, 
But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Now, the psalmist is struggling. He is he in turmoil. And he's saying, I'm trying to understand this, but every time I try to, it's so hard. It's a wearisome task. I get so burnt out and I'm so exhausted by thinking about why would God allow this, right? He's just struggling with this life question. And he couldn't figure it out. He couldn't see the promises of God. He couldn't, he looked out into the world and he did not see what God was saying was true. He could not see the goodness of God in the world. And then he went to the sanctuary of God. He went to, he went to church. Uh, he went to where the church was gathered. And who do you meet when you go to the sanctuary of God? You meet the people of God and you meet God. And that is where he finds hope in his spiritual struggle. You know, sometimes we feel like we need uh, to be right with God in order to go and worship God, in order to gather as church, right? We sometimes think, if I'm going to gather with the church, then I need to be in a proper mindset with God, right? I need to be good with God, right? Sometimes we think that. I think that too. If, if, sometimes I think if I want to be here on Sunday preaching to you, then I need to have a certain kind of spirituality. And while it is true that I'm held to more account because I am a leader, uh, the real truth of church is that we don't gather as church because we have all the answers right. We don't gather because we're already good, because we're already perfect. We gather because we have a lot of questions. We gather because we don't have all the answers. Because we're broken, because we're struggling, because there's, there are issues in our lives. This worship leader, think about this, this worship leader went to the temple, went to the sanctuary of God because he wasn't right with God. Do you see that? He didn't say, Oh, I have to get right with God first, and then I'll go to the sanctuary. No, it says, I went to the sanctuary, and then I understood. I met God. And it says, when he encountered God in worship, it says, he discerned their end. What he's saying is, he saw how the story ends. He understood all those people that he envied, that he was jealous of. He saw their reality. And he realized he was deceived. He realized he wasn't thinking correctly. Now, let me give you this illustration. Uh, if I'm given a room full of gold bars, so let's say someone decides to give me a giant room all of gold bars, so, you know, that's a lot of money. If there was a room this big, all filled with gold, think about that, that would be, I mean, it could be billions of dollars, I don't know exactly how much gold is worth, but if it was filling this room, millions, billions, I don't know, it would be a lot of money. So let's say I had this giant room full of gold, but I was jealous. I was jealous because of what someone else had. But let me clarify this. I was jealous, but also I was upset because I had to give one dollar away. I was upset that I had to give one dollar away, and I was jealous of someone who had ten dollars. Now, if I had that room full of gold bars, and someone said, you have to sacrifice one dollar. Is that a sacrifice? Not a sacrifice. I think we can all say, uh, when you have that much wealth, no one would consider a dollar a sacrifice. And also, to be jealous of someone who has nine more dollars than you. So you're holding this dollar, 
And someone says, you have to give this dollar away. And you're like, oh, no, I don't want to give this away. And on top of that, you're looking at someone who has nine more dollars than you. You're saying, oh my gosh, look at that person. That person has ten dollars. I wish I was that person. Now, I know this is a very silly example, but I'm making it very silly to make my point very clear. Now, if you saw someone acting this way, what would be your conclusion? What would be the logical reason for why they would be acting this way? Someone who had all this gold and was upset they had to give a dollar away and was jealous of someone who had ten dollars. What would be the logical reason for this person's reaction? You would say, number one, either this person is crazy, and they, they are not thinking straight, and they are not logical, and they are not reasonable, or you would say that person has no idea of how much that gold is worth. Or you would say that person doesn't believe that that gold is actually worth a lot. Our envy, what we are jealous of, reveals what is truly valuable to us. That's why I asked the question, what are you most envious of? When you look at someone who has something you don't have, see, we're all envious of different things. I'm probably not envious of the same things that you are envious of. Maybe some of you are envious of someone who achieved a certain rank in their career. Or maybe it's family, someone who had a specific kind of family. Our envy reveals what is truly valuable to us. And the psalmist, he realized that no matter how much he sang about how great and how awesome God was, in the end, he believed he was making sacrifices. That he was living for God without any gain. Why? Why did he think that he was making sacrifices? Why did he think that all of it was for nothing? Because material wealth and prosperity were far more valuable than God. That is just the clearest way to look at it. I mean, that's why I gave you this example. I want you to see as clearly as possible how ridiculous this looks when you put it like that. And the only rational reason that someone with a room full of gold would still believe that they're sacrificing when they have to give away so little is that they don't believe it's valuable or they don't know it's valuable. And this psalmist, he knows it's valuable here, but he doesn't believe it's valuable. He has to sing all the time about how great God is. But he says, it was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice. So we need to be very clear on this. Um, anytime we envy someone, or we resent the sacrifice that I had to do for God. Oh God, don't you see how much I sacrificed, right? When we feel that resentment, like God, look at how much I gave and look at how much you gave me. What we're really saying has nothing to do with inequality. It's not about they have more and I have less. It's not about I did more and they did less, but look at what happened. It's not actually about in unequal levels of wealth or unequal levels of activity. That's not what envy actually points to. Envy actually points to the value of God. I mean, when we get envious like that, we're actually saying something about God's value, about His worth. It has nothing to do with how much He did. It has nothing to do with wealth. It has everything to do with what you're saying about who God is. Two things happen uh, when we get into the presence of God. Uh, and this is what the psalmist sees. Number one, it says he discerns their end, right? He, he sees how the story ends for them. He sees that the human life, material things, wealth, reputation, success, all of his possessions, all of his relationships, in the end, they're like dust. So easily swept away. Here today, gone tomorrow. 
And what he sees is that these people who are mocking God, right? These rich people, these rich, arrogant people, they're mocking God, they're saying, what does God know, right? God has no control, God has no real power. And he sees, and he looks at their, their, their declarations of how God is powerless and unfaithful and, and, and not really in control, and he realizes how short-sighted they are, how limited their view is, because they, have, they can't even predict when they'll die. They may be the richest people, they may be the smartest people, they may be people with incredible authority and power, but they can't even predict when their lives will end. They don't know if they will live till tomorrow. They don't know if they'll live five more years or ten more years. They have no idea. And in light of the plan that God has for us that spans thousands of years, right, when we plan, we plan maybe a week ahead or a year ahead. Or if we're really organized, we plan decades ahead. Right? But God plans in the span of thousands. How can we as human beings judge how powerful, how wise, how just, or how faithful God is when that is the scope of his plan? Uh, that's like looking at a 500-page novel and reading one sentence out of that novel. You flip through the novel and there's one sentence and you read that one sentence and you say, I know everything about this book. That is, that is our, li our life. Our life, the span of God's plan, is like one, not, probably not even one sentence, maybe a period mark in a book of 500 pages. And yet we believe that we can discern God's will. We believe that we can judge God's plan in some way. And the psalmist is saying, oh, that is such short-sighted arrogance. You read one punctuation mark in a book of 500 pages, and you believe that you can say God is powerless. You can believe that God is unfaithful, that he has done nothing for his people. The second thing is what we see in the presence of God is in verse 25, 26. Uh, I know we didn't read this, so I'll just read it for you. Uh, he says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire, desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The second thing he understands is that God is unchanging. And also, he recognizes God is incredibly valuable. God is truly worthy. Those two things. God is worthy, God is truly valuable, and who he is as this incredible treasure is absolutely unchanging. That's what he means when he says, God will be my strength forever. Forever God will be with me. Forever God will be beautiful. And there is nothing, right? He says, there is nothing that I desire, nothing that I desire above you. You are my greatest desire, you are the one that I hunger after. Do you see? I want you to see how God ministers to this man. So again, remember, he, he came into this psalm jealous. God, look at all these arrogant, rich people who are doing whatever they want. They're singing how they want. And they're living so well. They're living with such success. And how does God minister to him? Does he even out the odds? Does he say, all right, you know what? You're right. It's unfair. Let me give you just as much wealth as, as they have. You know, you believe that you deserve this much wealth based on how much you did. So let me even out the odds, right? Let me fix this inequality. Is that how God ministers to him? No, he doesn't. He doesn't give him the riches that he's jealous of. He doesn't say, okay, then, you know what? You can sin, you can sin more. Right, because you know they get to sin all that you know like like you know they can sin whatever they want so let me give you a little more freedom let me give you a little more leniency okay you can sin this much more and you don't have to do these things for me right? I'll take these things out is that how God ministers to him no he 
doesn't, she doesn't work with that balance. She doesn't even out the scales. God saw that the issue was how he was viewing reality. And God pointed to what he envied, all of these things that he was so jealous of. And he said, you know, those riches, that wealth, all those things that you're envious of, uh, you think they're permanent. And you think they give you life. And God said, you know what? But they're actually dust. And they will actually lead you to death. They will actually lead you to something terrible. And then God pointed to himself and said, those things are dust, but I am not dust. I am permanent. I am unchanging. Those things, if you obsess over them, they are good things, but if you obsess over them, they will lead to your death. But if you make me your obsession, if you make me your all-consuming desire, then you will have life. And I believe God made that contrast for him. Helped him to see this is not what you thought it was. And I am not what you thought it was. But I believe that we're actually in a much better place than this psalmist was. Because he never met Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was. Uh, he didn't have the Gospels. He didn't have the New Testament. Uh, he was struggling, and he eventually found uh, the right perspective. But we're in such a better place. I mean, he was struggling with wanting to switch places with someone, right? He said, I want to switch places with that person, with those people, all those rich and powerful people. I want to switch places with them. And we live with the truth, right? On this side of the cross and the resurrection, we live with the truth that Jesus switched places with us. That is powerful to think about. You know, when our hearts are empty, or we're trying to meet our needs apart from God, what do we do? We want to switch with people because we're envious, we're jealous, uh, we want to be better even at the expense of someone else. Even if someone else gets hurt or someone else fails. But Jesus showed us that when you have the love of the Father in your hearts, something very different happens. You desire to switch Places so that someone else will be in a more blessed and prosperous place. Do you see how it changes? When we don't have Jesus in our hearts, when we are not resting in God, we desire to switch places so that other people will be less than us and will be better, right? We want to elevate ourselves. When Jesus is in our heart, when we have the love of the Father in our hearts, we still want to switch places but we want other people to be more blessed and more prosperous. It is a complete reversal of that mentality. So Jesus, he went from his place on the throne and he switched with us. And when we live with the reality of what Jesus did, how he switched places with us, how he went to hell on the cross and we were raised up to the heavens to be sons and daughters of God. When we understand that exchange, that is what transformed our hearts. You have to understand where he was and where we were. You have to understand both places very well in order to really appreciate that exchange. But if you understand that, if you understand what it was that Jesus did when he switched with us, we no longer will have that desire out of envy to switch with other people. We won't need to because we'll be so grateful and so full because of the way that Jesus switched with us. So when you do that, you have the freedom to switch with anybody because you feel abundant. You feel full. You don't feel like you're sacrificing. See, this is the mark of a Christian who is doing well in their relationship with God. 
Christians should never feel like they are sacrificing. Because the gospel is a message of abundance. A Christian who feels like, I am sacrificing so much, they missed the gospel. They did not receive what God wanted them to receive. They're looking at the love of God, they're looking at this incredibly beautiful room that's filled with the presence of God, all the promises of God, and they're saying, you know what, either I don't know, maybe I don't realize what all the promises of God are, or maybe I know all the promises of God, all the gifts of God, all the blessings, what Jesus did on the cross, the switch, the great exchange, I see all that, but I don't believe it is more valuable than what that person has. But the gospel allows us to switch. And when the world looks at that, when the world sees us with that kind of mentality, that is what transformed the world. Because the world will look at us and they'll say, how can you sacrifice like that? They'll look at us and they'll say, look at these Christians, they're sacrificing so much for God. We don't understand, how could they love us so much? How could they be so selfless? And we will understand it's because they don't see that room. Like they don't see the room full of the presence of God. They don't see that room where we have all the gospel truths, all the promises of God. But that is what transforms the world when we recognize what we have and we're willing to switch because we're full and abundant. Let's pray together.